to one, the ground gives way. If you went too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. Barney had been told this often enough. Everybody had told him. His grandmother, every time he came to stay with her. His sister, every time she wasn't telling him something else. Barney had a feeling, somewhere in his middle, that it was probably true about the ground giving way. But still, there was a difference between being told and seeing it happen. And today was one of those grey days when there was nothing to do. Nothing to play, nowhere to go, except the chalk pit, the dump. Barney got through the rickety fence and went to the edge of the pit. This had been the side of a hill once, he told himself. Men had come to dig away chalk and left this huge hole in the earth. He thought of all the sticks of chalk they must have made and all the blackboards in all the schools they must have written on. They must have dug and dug for hundreds of years. And then they got tired of digging, or somebody had told them to stop before they dug away all the hill. And now they did not know what to do with this empty hole. And they were trying to fill it up again. Anything people didn't want, they threw into the bottom of the pit. He crawled through the rough grass and peered over. The sides of the pit were white chalk, with lines of flints poking out like bones in places. At the top was crumbly brown earth, and the roots of the trees that grew on the edge. The roots looped over the edge, twined in the air, and grew back into the earth. Some of the trees hung over the edge holding on desperately by a few roots. The earth and chalk had fallen away beneath them, and one day they too would fall to the bottom of the pit. Strings of ivy and the creeper called Old Man's Beard hung in the air. Far below was the bottom of the pit, the dump. Barney could see strange bits of wreckage among the moss, and elder bushes and nettles. Was that the steering wheel of a ship? The tail of an aeroplane? At least there was a real bicycle. Barney felt sure he could make it go, if only he could get at it. They didn't let him have a bicycle. Barney wished he was at the bottom of the pit. And the ground gave way. Barney felt his head going down and his feet going up. There was a rattle of falling earth beneath him and then he was falling, still clutching the clump of grass as he was falling with him. This is what it's like when the ground gives way, thought Barney. And then he seemed to turn a complete somersault in the air, bumped into a ledge of chalk halfway down, crashed through some creepers and ivy and branches, bang! and landed on a bank of moss. His thoughts did those funny things they do when you bump your head and you suddenly find yourself thinking about what you had for dinner last Tuesday. All mixed up with seven times six. Barney lay with his eyes shut, waiting for his thoughts to stop being mixed up. Then he opened. He was lying in a kind of shelter. Looking up, he could see a roof, or part of a roof, made of elder branches, a very rotten old carpet, and rusty old sheets of iron. There was a big hole, through which he must have fallen. He could see the white walls of the cliff. The trees and the creepers at the top and the sky with the clouds passing over it. Barney decided he wasn't dead. He didn't even seem to be very much hurt. 
He turned his head and looked around him. It was dark in this den, after looking at the white chalk, and he couldn't see what sort of place it was. It seemed to be partly a cave, dug into the chalk, partly a shelter built out over the mouth of the cave. There was a cool, damp smell. Wood lice and earwigs dropped from the roof where he had broken through. But what had happened to his legs? He couldn't sit up. He tried to. His legs wouldn't move. Perhaps I've broken them, Barney thought. What shall I do then? He looked at his legs to see if they were all right and found that they were all tangled up with creeper from the face of the cliff. Who tied me up, thought Barney, and he kicked his legs to try and get them free, but it was no use. There were yards of creeper trailing down the cliff. I suppose I got tangled up when I fell, he thought, except I would have broken my neck if I hadn't. He lay quiet and looked around the cave again. Now that his eyes were used to it, he could see further into the dark part of the cave. There was somebody there, or something. Something or somebody had a lot of shaggy black hair and two bright black eyes that were looking very hard at Barney. Hello, said Barney. Something said nothing. I fell down the cliff, said Barney. Somebody grunted. Mm. My name's Barney. Somebody something made a noise that sounded like Stig. Do, do you think you could help me undo my feet, Mr Stig? Asked Barney politely. I've got a pocket knife, he added, remembering that he had his pocket in his pocket a knife he'd found among the wood shavings on the floor of Grandfather's workshop. It was quite a good knife, except that one blade had come off and the other one was broken in half and rather blunt. Good thing I put it in my pocket, he thought. He wriggled so he could reach the knife and managed to open the rusty half blade. He tried to reach the creepers round his legs but found it was difficult to cut the creepers with the blunt knife when your feet are tied above your head. The thing sitting in the corner, seemed to be interested. He got up and moved towards Barney into the light. Barney was glad to see it was somebody after all. Funny way to dress, though, he thought. Rabbit skins round the middle and no shoes or socks. Oh, Puff, said Barney, I can't reach my feet. You do it, Stig. He handed the knife to Stig. Stig turned it over and felt it with his strong, hairy hands and tested the edge with his thumb. Then, instead of trying to cut the creepers, he squatted down on the ground and picked up a broken stone. He's going to sharpen the knife, thought Barney, but no. It seemed more as if he was sharpening the stone, using the hard knife to chip with. Stig was carefully flaking tiny splinters off the edge of the flint until he had a thin, sharp blade. Then he sprang up and with two or three slashes cut through the creeper that tied Barney's feet. Barney sat up. Golly, he said, you are clever. I bet my granddad couldn't do that, and he's very good at making things. Stig grinned, and then he went back to the back of the cave and hid the broken knife under a pile of rubbish. My knife, protested Barney, but Stig took no notice. Barney got up and went into the dark part of the cave. He'd never seen anything like the collection of bits and pieces, odds and ends, bric-a-brac and old brock that this stig creature was lying about his den. 
There were stones and bones, fossils and bottles, skins and tins, stacks of sticks and hanks of string. There were motor car tyres and hats from old scarecrows, nuts and bolts and bobbles from brass bedsteads. There was a coal scuttle full of dead electric light bulbs and a basin with rusty screws and nails in it. There was a pile of bracken and newspapers that looked as if they were used for a bed. The place looked as if it had never been given a tidy up. Oh, I wish I lived here, said Barney, and Stig seemed to understand that Barney was approving of his home, and his face lit up. He took on the air of a householder showing a visitor round his property and began pointing out some of the things that he seemed particularly proud of.